especially in the first topic of India's one presentation of financial statements. Now, as far as India's one is concerned of presentation of financial statements, you have to first appreciate that against this standard, there was no corresponding standard which was there under our current Indian gap. The current AS1 only deals with disclosure of accounting policies. It does not deal with the presentation of financial statements. See, in our country, we have a very different situation compared to what is there internationally as far as presentation of financial statements is concerned. See, globally, there is not a detailed specified statutory format which is laid down for the preparation of financial statements. Like we have in India, whether it was earlier a Schedule 6 under the Companies Act, currently Schedule 3. Banking Regulation Act also has a specified format. Mutual funds have a specified format, insurance companies, electricity companies and so on all have a specified format. Whereas internationally, I think there is no prescribed format laid down by the regulator for the preparation of financial statements. There are only the basic minimum line items which need to be presented and then there are detailed disclosure requirements which are laid down in the individual standards. Whereas here in our country, even under the India's regime, the regulator from the companies has prescribed the Schedule 3 which is applicable for the India's companies. Now the question arises as far as banks and NBFCs is concerned which would be migrating to India's from the next, in the next phase. There also, for NBFCs, there is an exposure draft of the Schedule 3 format of the financial statements which is laid down, which I will try to just briefly touch upon. As far as the banks is concerned, as I said, currently under the Banking Regulation Act, under the third schedule, there is a format for the financial statements which has been specified. Now, some of you may be aware, especially those who are either in the banking sector or who are auditors or associated as auditors or consultants with the banks, that the RBI had come up with a circular some time back whereby there was a pro forma format for financial statements which was laid down. And also banks have already started submitting information to the RBI on the basis of that pro forma format. The idea is to get them into the proof, so to say. So currently, that is the only format which is available as far as banks is concerned. There is nothing which the RBI or anything as an amendment to the Banking Regulation Act which has still coming. How that would come in, whether it would need an amendment to the Banking Regulation Act or whether RBI in terms of its powers under the Banking Regulation Act will prescribe a format for the financial statements is something which we will have to see. But what we will probably also do in the course of our presentation, briefly touch upon what are the salient features or what are the additional things or what are the changes vis-a-vis -vis the existing format for the financial statements for banks will also be touched upon and how all of this gels with the requirements under INDAS-1 because INDAS-1 basically as I said does not give any format except for the minimum line items it only gives certain general principles which are there for the preparation and presentation of financial statements most of which we are already adopting, most of which it is expected that all the users, whether they be auditors or whether they be in the industry or as consultants, are aware. So it, to that extent, there is nothing really vastly different, except for three or four specific disclosure requirements which are laid down, which were not there earlier and which is what the companies are expected to take care of and companies have also taken care of during the first phase. So that is in a nutshell what INDAS-1 stands for. So these are just the general contents which are there, nothing much. Objective and scope I think, nothing great really. 
prescribing the basis for general purpose financial thing. I think what is important to note is that this index is applicable to the general purpose financial statements and not any specific statements which you may submit say to your bankers or to any other regulators if they are required co co covering specific aspects. Because general purpose financial statements are those financial statements which are intended for the general use of the public. They are not customized. This applies to standalone consolidated, does not apply to interim financial statements. And as I have indicated to you, the recognition, measurement and disclosure requirements under the individual indices have to be also kept in mind and taken into account. What is a balance sheet? I'm sure we don't need to really go into that. The guidance note defines what is the only thing is that the guidance note of the terms used in the preparation of financial statements defines the balance sheet as a statement which exhibits assets and liabilities and so on at their respective book values. Now that is where now technically as we saw a lot of things would be at the fair value. Probably so that is where there may be some change. What is a PNL account? Everybody knows what that is, so I won't even go into it. Excess of revenues over expenses or the other way around. This is a new statement for a statement of changes in equity which has been introduced as a result of India's. Now I would also say that this is something which is a new statement, but indirectly we are already preparing a statement of changes in equity, but reflecting it really as part of the balance sheet under the scheduled reserves and surpluses wherein essentially we show all the movements within different types of reserves and it, within the retained earnings your PNL appropriation what we were earlier showing now even under the schedule 6 and the schedule 3 even under for Indian gap purposes those details were now shown as movements and we have done away with the concept of a PNL appropriation account so indirectly that is already there in the as far as the statement of changes in equity is concerned. In simple terms, as is there, it, ex it depicts the movement of the various components of equity or what we commonly refer to as shareholders funds. It basically shows the changes in the other comprehensive and I just get into what is other comprehensive income shortly. But essentially equity is Basically, into two parts, you have the components of equity and then you have basically what is the other comprehensive income. And what are the major components of the other comprehensive income? They are essentially all changes which happen mainly because of some fair value measurement changes. They are not changes due to the normal day-to-day -day operations of the company. Those are all measurement changes because of adoption of, primarily because of adoption of the fair value, which are all reflected through another comprehensive income. In simple terms, we may refer to that as what we typically refer to as the below the line adjustments. That is what is your other comprehensive income. Now the concept of total comprehensive income means it is effect effectively what we were referring to as your net profit. That is now given the term total comprehensive income. So we are also currently also as part of our statement of changes in equity presenting a movement or a reconciliation between the various components of equity, essentially the transactions with the owners, including any buybacks, any distribution of dividend and so on. So all those movements are all depicted at the reserves of this now all those would be depicted under a statement of changes in equity. Those of you who have already been part of the phase one implementation and who would have referred to the format of the financial statements for India's companies under Schedule 3 would have seen a format of statement of changes in equity which essentially in a columnar form reflects the various components of equity, it reflects the different categories of resource and all the adjustments which are reflected through the other comprehensive income which we saw like your evaluation surplus changes, fair value changes due to financial assets and liabilities and so on, all the movement because of that. 
plus all the dividend distribution or any buyback or any other transactions with the shareholders, bonus issues and all, all those are reflected. The main purpose being to essentially reconcile the equity. Now as far as for banking companies is concerned, this is where again, currently there is no requirement for banks to really again prepare a separate statement of changes in equity. Only the banking regulation and format lays down the movements in the reserves and surplus. So that is where the thing is there. But as we will see later on, the pro forma format in the RBI circular, which I will be showing to you sometime later, does have a format which shows the movement in equity or it does reflect a statement of changes in equity, which I will run you through later on. Later. Cash flow statement, I think we all know what it represents, so I don't want to really waste much time on that. Even notes and significant accounting policies also are all an important ingredient and a component of any financial statement. Comparative information has to be also presented. The only issue here which you need to now make note of is, see up to now, if there was any error, we used to basically reflect that error as a prior period adjustment. We never used to restate retrospectively any corrections because of prior period items. Now that concept has gone under EDS 8, which is corresponding to our current accounting standard 5, which deals with prior period items and changes in accounting policies. That now says that if there is any error, you need to restate retrospectively the effect of that statement. So that means that if it is something which pertains to a period more than what we are giving our comparative financials for the last two years, we need to make a retrospective restatement and give an opening balance sheet for the earliest comparative period where an entity makes an accounting policy change retrospectively or makes a retrospective restatement due to any error or correction. Otherwise, in the normal course, we have to only give comparatives for two years. Of course, for the first time transition, you need to also give an opening balance sheet date on the date of transition. That is okay. But going forward also, there could be situations where if there are prior period items and prior period adjustments which are there on effect, if there are any changes in accounting policies which take place, we need to give effect to that retrospectively. So that may also necessitate giving a balance sheet for three years. See, take an example of company in the first phase and already done its India's implementation. Now this is the second year. 17, 18 is the second year for the phase one companies. If during the course you find that there is some error which pertains to the financial year 13, 14 or 14, 15. So for that purpose, now we are not, we said we will be only giving during the second year only comparatives for 17, 18 and for 16, 17. That means the earliest opening period is 1st April 2016. Now this is an error pertaining to a period prior to that. So we may have to essentially give even an earlier year's opening balance sheet. So we would have to give an opening balance sheet as of 1st April 2016, which is the earliest period. Otherwise, in the normal course, we would have only given the balance sheet as of 31st March 18 and as of 31st March 2017. So that is essentially the thing which you need to keep in mind. So there is no concept now of a prior period adjustment in simple terms. You have to retrospectively restate. Then the important thing is there, which in any case we are already following, is that the financial statements needs to be distinguished from other information like your DNA or any other financial data which is given. You have to distinguish that clearly. Then this principles governing 
faithful presentation, selection of appropriate accounting policies, compliance with the requirements, all those are all things which all of you are already aware of. Everybody knows what is going concern and what is accrual. Those are all concepts which are already there. So I am not really elaborating on those because some of these are already things which are there in our existing AS1. Nothing different clearly. Materiality and aggregation again is something which all of you are aware. So I am not even elaborating on that. Another important aspect which is covered is basically on offsetting. So you are now offsetting on what we in simple terms now refer to as netting off. It's not something which can be which can be done just arbitrarily. Offsetting is permissible only to achieve substance over form and there are individual accounting standards which tell you when you need to offset or net off, especially the standard on financial instruments. It gives guiding principles on when you can offset. Offset is only when it, uh, it is legally permissible and when the parties intend to settle transactions on a net basis. So it does not mean that if you have a debtor and a creditor, you can just automatically offset it. Unless there is a legal requirement or unless there is a clear-cut understanding between the parties to net off their debit and credit balances. On a similar line up to now, what we have been doing is, we have also been, for example, if there is an obsolescence for inventory, or if there is a provision for doubtful debts. We have been netting it off against the individual balance. Now that is not permissible. You have to show that separately. You have to show your obsolete inventory or written down inventory separately. You have to quantify the amount. Currently, or up to the time we were following Indian Gap, very few companies would disclose in their financial statements what is the slow moving inventory for which they have made a provision or what is the obsolete inventory which they have written on. It would go as part of the normal consumption. Now you cannot net that off against inventory. You cannot offset it. So that is also another important change which you need to keep in mind when you are following EDS. The frequency of reporting, consistency and all we have already seen, I have discussed with you in AS requirements, especially for retrospective changes and all that. Now, these are also other things which are highlighted, which are all specified, which we are already following. Information which needs to be prominently displayed and repeated. Name of the reporting entity, change, whether it is consolidated with a standard of financial statements. Then there is a concept of presentation currency which is laid down in EKS 21, which I'm sure would be covered when we have the session on EKS 21. So I'm not going into details of that. What is the level of rounding of which you are following that you need to discuss? So nothing new really as far as that part is concerned. Now, as I said, the EKS per se does not lay down or prescribe any specific format for the financial statements, either the balance sheet or the PNM. It only lays down certain minimum line items which needs to be disclosed. As I said earlier, the current format for banks has been laid down in the third schedule. See, currently NPMCs also are required to follow the normal format or were required to follow the normal format which was applicable to the other companies under Schedule 3 under the Companies Act. Now, under NDS, even for the NBFCs, there is a prescribed exposure graph which the Institute has come out with as to the financial statements. It is presumed that those would also be statutorily notified as part of the company that they will loss once it is applicable. Even as far as the banks is concerned, it is expected that the RBI would prescribe a format for the financial statements probably on similar lines as in the pro forma format 
which it has motivated, which the RDI has notified. Though, of course, there are certain technical issues which are there as far as that format is concerned, which I will probably touch upon. So, as I said, this RBI circular dated 23rd June basically specifies a format or a pro forma for the financial statements. See, this format and pro forma is on similar lines as the existing format under the third schedule of the Banking Regulation Act, those of you who are familiar with that. Except that there are certain additional line items which are specifically required as per the pro forma format on the main balance sheet. So these are some of the additional line items. And what we can probably do is We'll just quickly go to the RBI circular. See, this is the RBI circular which is there. If you let us just very quickly. Let's see the next year. This is the broad format, which is which is the pro forma format, which the RBI has specified on the asset side. Most of the items are similar to the format which is laid down and prescribed in the Banking Regulation Act. As I said, certain additional cash balances, bank balances, and all those are the same. Derivatives need to be disclosed separately. Goodwill is something which needs to be shown separately. On the liability side, derivative financial instruments, subordinated liabilities is also an additional line item which has been laid down. You have the equity, share capital and other equity. Then there is the statement of changes in equity which is also on the similar lines as the <coughs> format under Schedule 3. Your movement with the share capital is the first part which is there. And then after that, you have the other equity, which is nothing but in a columnar form, your share application money, your equity component of the financial instruments, and then the various reserves and surplus items which we have been showing. And then the items of other comprehensive income, your fair value changes in equity instruments, remeasurement of defined benefit plans, gains or losses of financial instruments to OCI exchange inferences. Essentially, all what we would typically refer to as the below the line items. So, any, so these are all items of other comprehensive income. What we saw OCI having two components. One is your actual equity, your reserves and surplus, and this. This is also similar to the format which we currently have under Schedule Three for the companies. More or less, that is similar also for the banks in the format which RBI has specified. And then, of course, there are individual disclosure requirements. If PNL also, slightly the format is changed for the banks at least compared to what is already there under, under the current banking regulation. Act. The net interest income needs to be shown. The net fees and commission income needs to be shown. What we were showing earlier is been under the banking regulation act and even in our PNL, we are showing all the items of operating income, other income, and then expenses, whether they are operating expenses or other expenses. Here, I think the idea is to first show the net interest income and the net fee and commission income. So essentially, the net income, and then whatever is the fair value changes, and then after that, you have your total income and then all the other expenses. So this is the broad format. So just to give you an idea, of what the thinking of the RBI is. And this is the format in which banks are already required to submit their pro forma information from the quarter ending June or September. So data has already been submitted by the banks to the RBI in this format for the banks to just get an idea. There are of course other detailed requirements also which are there. So all of y'all can refer to this circular dated 23 June. So as 
I said, these are some of the additional line items which are the subtract. These are some of the additional line items which are there. Yes? Okay. Now the main thing which is there is in the statement for financial assets and liabilities. Again, that is a columnar statement which is there which gives the summarized classification of all assets and liabilities under these broad headings. These are the requirements under the financial instrument standard. So essentially on a tabular basis you need to classify this. Now these are the minimum line items which are there. I think you can refer to them in your printout. Whether it is your property, plant and equipment property, but ultimately this will override the disclosure requirements which are laid down by the regulators, whether under the Banking Act or under Schedule 3 or wherever, and also the disclosure requirements under individual accounting center. Now additional line items sub. See, there is no bar of presenting additional line items. So that is always there. An important point which you need to note, this is second bullet point. Assets within the same class, which are subject to a different measurement basis, have to be presented as separate line items. Many cases you may measure certain items of fixed assets at cost, certain items of fixed assets at fair value, for example. Those need to be presented as separate line items. Specific disclosure requirements have to be laid down. The next, the another important point which needs to be noted in the context of banks especially and financial institutions and NPFCs is with regard to the current and non-current classification. Now all of you all are aware of the current and non-current classification because this was already codified in the revised Schedule 6 which ultimately became Schedule 3 under the Companies Act 2013. So we were already following the operating cycle and current non-current classification. Now that is something which emanated at that point of time from the IFRS standard, IAS 1 which also lays down the concept of current and non-current, which was replicated and made as part of our Schedule 6 and Schedule 3, even before EAS was applicable. Now, a question arises. Going forward for banks, how will this get captured? Because in banks, under the Banking Regulation Act format, which is currently there in the third schedule, there is no concept of current and non-current. There is no separate. The only way the current and non-current comes into the picture is through the RBI disclosure of your ALM, which gives your maturity profile under various buckets. That is the only medium through which that information currently is getting captured. Also, in the RBI proforma, which I showed you, there is no way a distinction, nowhere a distinction between the current and the non-current classification in that format. So it is hoped that when the RBI, whenever it prescribes a format, it either takes care of that, and if it does not take care of that, then we would need to ensure that at least what is the current and non-current portion of all your assets and liabilities, primarily your advances and investments and primarily your borrowing liabilities gets captured even if a statutory format is not prescribed by the RBI. So that is one area for the banks especially we need to take care of to ensure that we comply with in the S1. Whereas for the companies per se, and even for NPFCs where the Schedule 3 format has already been prescribed, that already lays down the current and non-current classification. So there it is only for banks, this 
the compliance with this requirement may present some challenges, so it is hoped that the RBI will probably lay down some format or a specific disclosure requirement. Otherwise, we will have to do it. So that is one important point here which needs to be. Though, of course, it is not very critical, but at the same time, you need to follow it. I mean, maybe you will have to go on the basis of your AL and classification and so on. So what is current and non-current, we already know as per Schedule 3 and Schedule 6, so I am not really getting into it, things which are within your normal operating cycle. And generally a rebuttable presumption that it is 12 months, unless it is for certain companies in the real estate and all, where there could be a longer period. As I said, PNL also again, PNL one point which you need to note is, that we have gone for a single statement approach. Whereas under IAS, there is an option where you have a main PNL statement followed by a statement of other comprehensive income, which essentially has to show the movements in other comprehensive income or what we typically refer to as the below the line adjustments need to be shown separately. Whereas we are following a continuous format for the preparation of the PNL. So you have the total comprehensive income which I referred to earlier. Again, like in the case of balance sheet, the minimum nine items as per India's are there in the subsequent slide. As I said, again, like the balance sheet, the current format of PNL, how that need RBI will specify something on the lines of the pro forma format which I showed you in the circuit. And also, non-controlling interest needs to be shown separately, so that we are already showing in any case minority what we commonly refer to as. Again, here I already showed you that pro forma. It is more or less on the same lines as the banking regulation and format which is currently laid down, except that the interest income and expense separately at the beginning of the year on a net basis. Fees and commission income and expense separately on a net basis at the beginning of the year. And then all your fair value changes, impairment changes and so on. And also the concept of exceptional items is there. That there is a requirement which is there. Though in the standard per se under NDS and IFRS there is nothing like an exceptional item. But this is something which your we have specifically adopted. So that is an additional item. Otherwise, what are the minimum line items are laid down? But as I said, that is only academic because already a detail format is there. Only thing to be noted is that whatever revenue you calculate on the basis of your EIR or your IIR, that has to be disclosed separately. And any gains and losses because of the recognition also have to be separately. Nothing should be classified as extraordinary items. Exceptional is different, those which are up, but nothing is extraordinary. This debate had come up when the 9 11 attack happened. And there was a debate in the US among accountants, I was told, as to whether these 9 11 losses or whether we should consider those as extraordinary items. What I was given to understand is that no, there is nothing extraordinary. You probably, even if you suffer something of the magnitude of a 9-11, losses from that are not anything which is extraordinary. You are living in a world where terrorism and all is there, so probably nothing extraordinary. As I said, again, specific disclosure requirements under the individual PDS have also been laid down. So our other comprehensive income, as we already saw in that format, mainly changes in your revaluation surplus, your remeasurement of defined benefit plans, translation losses or gains on foreign operations, with all your financial instruments, movements of the fair value, where you have opted to follow the OCI, especially for equity. Then changes in fair value attributable to changes in the credit risk or liabilities designated at fair value to PNN. Items which need to be reclassified to profit and loss and which are not so reclassified to be disclosed separately. Means essentially any reclassification which we have done retrospectively needs to be shown separately. 
Here, the only thing which I would like to probably just draw your attention to is the Sekandla Sulet. Changes in the fair value attributable due to changes in the credit risk or liabilities designated as fair value to PNL. Now, that is something which has to be reflected through OCI. Now, what would be the impact due to a fair value change if there is a decrease in the fair value? How would it impact your profit or loss? Can anybody say? How will it impact your fair value change if there is a change in the credit risk, namely a deterioration? How will it impact your fair value? It will reduce or increase your fair value. Hmm? Your credit risk has deteriorated. So what will happen to your fair value? Huh? How many are saying reduce? Okay. Anybody say increase? Will it increase or reduce the fair value? Think logically. What is the fair value? Will it increase or reduce? See, you have a liability. Now there is a deterioration in the credit. So what will happen? It is expected that you will not be able to service it to the full extent, right? So your fair value of your liability would increase, right? So that could basically it could change. So there is a benefit for you. I'm oh, sorry, you will have to pay a lower amount, so it will reduce, right? So that gain, how do you take it? To the PNL? No, so you don't take it to the PNL, but you take it to OCI. Because you cannot take a benefit out of something for which you are going to default in the future. So that is, I think, a car which is there from India. Internationally, even those fair value gains, fair value changes because of a deterioration in the credit risk were taken to the PNL, right? But those, I think, we have opted for a specific car out. It's our car out. Huh? It's an India's car out. It is an India's car out which is there, so which is also getting reflected in under India's one. So that is one, one point which you have to just note. Excuse me. Yes. This is for both increase as well as reduction. Any change in the fair value. So normally I think I mean we say that the fair value changes because there is an increase in your credit risk. Increase or decrease in credit risk. It could be anything, any, yes. Anything. But any change goes to the OCI. Okay. Components of statement of changes in equity, we already saw the format. The impact of any retrospective application or retrospective restatement also needs to be recognized. Otherwise, I think we already saw the format, we've already covered that. We already saw this in the format which is there on that columnar statement of statement of changes in equity and OCI. What are the significant accounting policies, measurement cases, management judgments? There is a preponderance and overuse of judgments, all that has to be documented now in one place. This is one area where I have found that in the first place companies have not been consistent and serious in their documentation of all the management estimates and judgments. There are many practices which are there. All the sources of estimation uncertainty have to be disclosed separately. Whether it is your litigation provisions, decommissioning liabilities, actuarial assumptions, ECL methodology which you adopt, the determination of the assessment for deferred tax, and various other items. All those the estimation uncertainty needs to be now disclosed with reasonable prominence preferably in one place. That is an important disclosure. I think even the earlier speaker emphasized that there is not much importance given to disclosures. This is also one of the areas. The disclosures especially of your management judgments and estimates. Now, also apart from the normal accounting policies which are there for banks, I think, a proper 
disclosure of the significant accounting policies for some of the items here. I have just tried to list them to give you a flavor. The classification and measurement of financial assets. The initial measurement, the subsequent measurement, the business model which is followed. I am sure all of this would be discussed in new course during the program. Impairment including your ECL methodology and all that. Criteria for segregation of your portfolio. Where credit risk has deteriorated, not deteriorated, and so on, all those aspects will be covered in the then derivatives and hedge accounting, the recognition, offsetting, <coughs> approach to exceptions under INDS 101, all those are specific matters. An important aspect relevant for banks and MDFCs is your risk management policies under 107. Even currently, companies also have been making risk management disclosures. This is again another area where probably a lot of application of mind is not always there even for the phase one companies. The disclosures in some cases are very detailed, there is an overview. Whereas in certain cases it is just a very generalistic description which is there. We need to strike a proper balance. And this is going to play a more important role in your risk management policy disclosures as far as banks and NDFC systems also. All your 107 requirements. The earlier speaker, Mr. Dolphy, this is a major reference to maturity analysis, sensitivity analysis. And there are various other aspects also which are there, dealing with your various risks which are relevant for the business and industry in which you are operating. So that will also be very important even for the banking sector, for the financial services. This is another specific disclosure requirement which is there for capital management policies. Capital related disclosure, essentially the NPT's capital management policies. Now this is also there for the other companies. Now here again, there is no consistency. Some companies have given elaborate disclosure, whereas some companies have just maybe copy pasted from someone without actually having a policy in place. So this is where we are, even as auditors, we have a duty to ensure that something which the company is disclosing is actually part of a policy document which has been approved by the top management, preferably at the board level. See, in certain cases, there are statutory restrictions or requirements of the minimum capital laid down, so that naturally you have to disclose. And that would be more relevant for the banking and the financial sector, insurance companies and so on, where the regulators have laid down the minimum capital requirements. But apart from that, you need to make a general description. What is your debt equity ratio? What is the maximum level of that? What is the level where you would be using subordinated debt because that is would be relevant for banks. RBI also has laid down the parameters. Any compliance with externally imposed capital requirements like your capital adequacy ratio, minimum network requirements and so on. So that is something which needs to be kept in mind. This is again another area where the disclosures are not always necessarily intended in the manner in which it should be. So these are all these type, apart from the normal specific disclosures that you disclose this balance, that accounting policy, these specific qualitative disclosures are again something which is very important and critical, which I'm sure over a period of time will get refined and improved. Dividend related disclosures. Now certain categories of listed companies are already required to have a dividend policy. Even other companies should at least frame some sort of a dividend policy, dividend related disclosures. Then of course name of the entity and all that is normal. So this basically takes care of India's one in a nutshell. No rocket science. At the same time, you have to appreciate that there are certain specific requirements which are there. Capital disclosures is a specific requirement. Principles are laid down 
for offsetting. That is again something which is different. So these are all specific new requirements which are laid down. The formats, the statement of changes in equity is a new format. The concept of other comprehensive income is again a new concept. So these are the four or five main changes which you need to keep in mind. Then I have also tried to touch upon what is relevant or what is going to be relevant from the point of view of banks and NBFCs in a nutshell. Pending of course the detailed format being given out by the RBI and so on. So maybe maybe I can take one or two questions on this standard before I proceed to the next two standards which are more or less similar. Yeah, question sure, yeah, sir. Sir, we refer to statement of changes and errors. Yes. yes. Sir, you refer to the uh, changes and errors when there's a retrospective effect to be given the financial statements. Yes. Where it relates to a period prior to the previous year. Yes. Then you draw opening balance sheet. Yes. Do you draw opening balance sheet? Yes, or yes. You, or you, you adjust the opening retail earnings? You can it? adjust the opening retail earnings That's also, or you, or you, hey, this standard also specifies that you have to give the balance sheet of the earliest period for which there is a retrospective because if you restate your retail earnings means your balance sheet also would change. So you need to give the because that is the wording which is used in the standard. The balance sheet of the earliest period for which a retrospective change is made. So I would interpret it as you may need to give the opening balance sheet of the earliest period. That is how I would interpret it. unless if you have some views on this on Osema. I think we will have to see how companies do it for this year. I think, uh, to my mind, uh, it can be without balance sheet. For them, it has to be explained. That explain, yes. We may need to explain which nine items are changing. Probably that may need to be given. But from a plain reading. Yeah, because even the, extent, the extensive of the balance sheet is a very detailed process and we do not expect people to go into that situation. Yes. Right? So, I mean, I but think internationally, I think. Even if there is, even if there is a, uh, no clarification, I would tend to be on the side of not providing it in that sense. Because it's not, it's not providing not providing the balance sheet. Balance sheet. Okay. Only first time adoption. First time adoption. No, but internationally, as far as you are required to give balance sheets for three years. Yeah, but then when, when that, that is the case with IFRS and EPS, the carve out. So yes. we have to deal with that. No, but probably based on that wording that the balance sheet for the earliest opening period, indirectly you could interpret that only maybe not in all cases you give three balance sheets, but only in cases where there are probably any retrospective adjustments. In such cases you may need to. I mean that is one way of interpreting. In any, in any case, the transition will have three. Transition is there. It is only from the second period onwards. That is where. I don't think from the second period will have maybe. Not required. Not, may not be required, but I mean it is again as I said an area which is not yeah, I just go, go by your earlier statement, sometimes there is an overkill. So that's yeah, overkill. this is an overkill, but you never know how maybe. Maybe some, maybe some sort of clarification on probably at the I, so IPFG or something. So the conclusion is to also alternatively adjust that it's opening in the There is no conclusion, that is an interpretation. That, that would be an interpretation. There is no definite conclusion. Yes, but it's a good question, yes. Any other question? Yes, please, the mic, please, get me to. Uh, back, back, back. When we talk about offsetting, yes. uh, we talk about uh, provisions of offsetting, how can we offset? Yes. Where do we show it? Then the it shows in the, it goes as part of your PNL, you don't net off your inventory in the balance sheet. So, that's, so balance sheet perspective, if inventory is 100, provision is 20, balance sheet was 100, was 80. Sorry? On the balance sheet, yes. if the inventory at cost is 100, yes. provision for options is 20. That should be shown separately. So 100 has to be shown separately as well? Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. Provision 20. Yes. No, no, you don't net it off. Your, your obsolescence will go as a separate liability side. So 
22 shows, yes. 17 in the rapid pace. Yes. And to which for output is, will that be yes. less of or will that be shown yeah. separately? You see, it may not be shown separately, you may quantify what is the amount you have charged, but ultimately the second effect for that will be under some of your other liabilities or any miscellaneous liabilities account. Because under India's 2 also, there is a now a specific disclosure requirement that any changes in the inventory due to either write-offs or obsolescence or slow moving provisions, you need to disclose that separately. That is the dealer interest. Huh? That is the dealer interest, right? Yes, but the balance sheet also you cannot take it off against inventory. Okay, so that's for inventory. Yes. For downfall debts, how does one do it? Sorry? For doubtful debt provisions. Yeah, doubtful debts also basically you cannot, you have to show that separately under liabilities. You cannot get off the number, you need to reflect it somewhere separately. That even under the in days 107 or 109, there is a specific there are specific disclosure requirements that you need to reflect on that separately. See, currently banks, I think in many cases, all your NPA provisions get netted off. They may not all, they may be reflected separately as a note, but in the balance sheet it is netted off against your advances. Only provision for standard assets, because RBI specifically requires you to show it as a liability. So now that same principle will apply for this also. Like how banks are showing their banks and NPFCs are showing their provision for standard assets. Okay, so can we now go to the next is a relatively simple or I would say deceptively simple standard. property, plant and equipment or what we have commonly been used to referring to as mixed assets. See this standard, the challenges are more in the transition rather than on the ongoing implementation. See on an ongoing basis there are very few major changes in because accounting for fixed assets is the way it is. The only major change on an ongoing basis is if you decide to adopt the fair value model, you have to adopt it consistently and not on a selective basis like you are doing a revaluation now, you do it now and then don't do it for the next 5 or 10 years. That is now no longer permissible. Then apart from that, there is the components approach which also I would not classify it and categorize it as a gap difference because under the companies and itself also now componentization has to be followed under schedule 2. So that itself is not a gap difference. So otherwise the gap differences are mainly in the transition issue or in the first time adoption which we would see. Otherwise it is more or less similar lines except some very subtle changes which are there. So we will just quickly run through those. Even in the depreciation, the way I would look at it now, there is not much of a gap difference because if companies are adopting Schedule 2, which is now useful life based the depreciation, there is really no major gap difference. The other changes as far as your provision for decommissioning and restoration liabilities, the costs for that, that is probably a gap change which is there to some extent. So that also now even the other companies following the Indian gap also, the AS10 has been modified. So to that extent now all companies virtually all the EPS requirements are now incorporated even as part of the AS10 for the companies which have to follow in their camp. So there is really not much of a difference. So we would run through 
the earlier part quickly. I would like to spend more time really on some of the transition issues and challenges, which is the last part. So what is the objective and what is included, what is excluded, anything which is covered within another accounting standard is excluded. The only one thing, one thing you need to note is the standard of agriculture in the S41. Now there, there is a concept of bearer plants. Now what are bearer plants? Bearer plants are plants which are used in the production and supply of agricultural produce. And they bear produce for more than one accounting period and it could not be sold as agricultural produce. Essentially any trees which bear some fruits or vegetables, mangoes or something. So those are bearer plants. So those are something like, those are treated within the definition of fixed asset. But the mangoes or the fruits which come out of that is basically like your inventory for your agricultural produce. So that is covered by the India's 41. So biological assets, which are which actually are of a much shorter duration, those are excluded. There is bearer plants which have more permanency in them. Those are within the definition. Now here, so any PPE used to develop or maintain assets in PND. See similarly your mineral rights and mineral reserves, your oil, natural gas and so on. Those are excluded as exploration and evaluation assets which there is a separate standard in this 105. But any plant, property plant or equipment to develop and maintain these assets would get covered. So that is one important point you need to note. What is carrying amount, what is cost, what is depreciation, depreciable amount, I am not going into that. It's already something which I expect everybody to know. Fair value also, what is an impairment loss, what is a PPE. So those are all definitions which are there. Recoverable amount again, the definition for impairment purposes, higher of an asset, fair value, less cost to sell, and its value in use. Residual value also, we all know, it is an amount which an entity would currently obtain from the disposal of an asset after deducting your estimated disposal costs. So normally you need to make an estimate whether it is 1%, 5%, 10%, 10%. Schedule 2 also specifies that. Useful life again, we all know what is that concept. There is nothing different, nothing different than the ETS. So basic principle again is the same. Probable that future economic benefits would accrue to the entity and the cost for those can be reliably measured. Now, spare part servicing and standby equipment. This is where, again, if you remember in the first session, in one of the slides, one of the areas where which has a major financial impact on your profit was your capital spares considered as fixed assets. Now this is one major change. Any spare parts, servicing or standby equipment, which is what we typically and commonly refer to as capital spares. They are recognized as a property plant and equipment. Now what is capital spares? Capital spares are items of spares which are only to be used against specific items of plant and machinery. They cannot be used for anything else. It is like an insurance spare. Only for a specific item. It does not have any other independent use. Up to now, companies have mostly been treating these items as part of an inventory. Now, we need to treat it as part of property, plant and equipment which means that they have to be depreciated over the useful life of the mother equipment for which they are intended to be used. So here we will see even in the transition, you cannot, which we will discuss later, 
we cannot take a shelter that whatever is the need cost we can carry on with that if there are some capital spares existing as on the date of transition we need to incorporate those as part of your property plant and equipment and ensure that the effect is given retrospectively so if it is some equipment which was purchased capital spare which was purchased <coughs> five years back you need to depreciate them for the first five years also take the effect to retain earnings and then bring the carrying value as of the date of transition and add that you cannot take shelter and i don't want to touch whatever is the carrying value of my property because this is a measurement basis which you are not following which you are required to follow under ETS so you cannot take that shelter behind the ETS 101 exception for the cost so this is one important and that is we saw in the first slide that is one of the major adjustments which companies have done on the transition to ETS capital space consider as PP replacement cost again to be capitalized if the recognition criteria are met. This is again your componentization. Major inspection costs also similar lines. This has to be capitalized. Now this is where something which probably there have been different practices in the past. So we need to ensure that we follow this. So any component which is as a separately identifiable useful life and which is something which is very material or significant, you need to capitalize that separately and ensure that the item against which it is replaced that is decapitalized or de-recognized. So this component technology. What is the elements of cost? is already what is there in the existing standard, your purchase price directly attributable costs. And the third item is when the initial estimate of any cost of dismantling and restoration to a site. Typically, this is an expenditure which will be incurred by mining companies, maybe telecom companies, oil and gas, and so on, where there are may, there may be some damage, and you are mandatorily and statutorily, or even based on customs or as goodwill gesture, required to bring it and restore the site to the original level. So any such costs, you need to make an estimate of that, that what you are going to incur at the end of the tenor, you need to make the present value of that upfront and account for it. So it is basically an I for which you need to make a provision. So it is a provision in terms of your EAS 37, which we will be looking at later. Cost of self-constructed assets are the same principles as AS2. The borrowing costs also, if any, in respect of that need to be capitalized. Assets, this is again another minor subtle change. Assets acquired on a deferred payment basis. The difference between your cash price equivalent and the total payment is recognized as an interest cost over the period. Your deferred credit which you get from your suppliers. So that the interest element has to be separated for that. Componentization we already discussed. <coughs> now if there is any exchange transactions, now what is considered as an exchange transaction? The cost of such items should be measured at fair value, which is also already a requirement in our existing standard. So, so cost of the items at fair value, unless the exchange transaction lacks commercial substance, and the fair value of the asset is reliably measurable. So when does a transaction have commercial substance? In simple terms, a transaction is deemed to have commercial substance if it is basically benefiting each of the parties in a similar lines. It should not be at an advantage to one party and at a disadvantage to other party. So the configuration of the cash flows differs from the configuration of the cash flows of the assets transfer. And the difference is significant relative to the fair value of the asset exchange. So unless if the transaction lacks commercial substance, only then. Now what is the, this is another change as I said, 
if you are following cost model, there is no issue. But if you are, if you opt to follow the revaluation model, the revaluation has to be done with sufficient regularity. Plus, you need to do the revaluation for the entire class of PPE to which the item belongs. And any changes because of revaluation have to be reflected through OCI. And any decrease in the carrying amount, which is left to be recognized under BLM, except to the extent that you already have a credit balance in the profit reserves and under revaluation surplus. So only to that extent, balance goes off to the PNL. And only on the derecognition or sale of that item, whatever balance remains in the revaluation surplus gets transferred to retail earnings. From that OCI part which was there at the other corner, it goes to the retail earnings. So that is the revaluation model major change. Currently, what are companies doing before revaluation? It's something which is very arbitrary. They may do a revaluation once in five years or ten years and then forget about it. Now you cannot do it, you have to do it with sufficient regularity. Whether upward or downward, and you have to do it for a class of assets. You cannot do it simply. So that is again a major change in revaluation. What are the factors determining the useful type of the asset? It is already something which we all know your normal obsolescence, legal limits, expected usage, physical character and so on. Nothing really significantly different. Only requirement now is that which is also there in any case now on the schedule 3 is that it has to be reviewed at the end of each financial year. The only change is that earlier, even if there was a change in the depreciation method, it was, a change, it was treated as a change in an accounting policy. But now if there is a change in the depreciation method, it is treated as a change in the accounting estimate. And it can be recorded, recorded for prospectively. You don't need to make a retrospective change. So that is, that is the only exception to the underlying principle where unless there is any change you do retrospectively. But as far as depreciation is concerned, it is any change in the depreciation, not only whether it is the useful life, but even if it is a change in the method, has to be accounted for as a change in an estimate. And it is a change in an estimate means only prospective effect has to be given. The depreciation you can do it only on SRM, WPP or unit of production method. Revenue method is not permissible. So for toll companies, toll road companies and all which are following revenue method, now that is no longer permissible. Then application of EPS 38, I think I am not getting into that because though I think that is already been covered as a separate standard later on, so we can just skip that for the time being. Be recognition, we all know when an item of a property plant and equipment has to be be recognized either on disposal or where there are no economic benefits and gain or loss goes to PNL so nothing, no rocket science now changes in decommissioning liability see the initial decommissioning liability you would need to take the present value at a particular discounted rate so if there are any changes because of changes in the estimated outflow or because of changes in the discounted rate, that has to be added or deducted from the cost of the asset in the current period. However, the amount which is deducted from the cost of the asset cannot exceed its actual carrying amount. And if the decrease in the liability exceeds your carrying amount, that excess has to be immediately recognized in your p &L. You have an asset of 100 rupees and you have estimated a restoration cost of 50 rupees over the next 5 years so you will take the present value of that. Now if the cash flow estimate changes or if your discount rate changes as a result of which the decommissioning cost goes below your carrying amount of the asset, the original carrying amount, the cost of the asset, that has to be immediately recognized into the PNL account. 
However, if the adjustment results into an addition in the cost of the asset, the, the entity shall consider whether this is an indication that the new carrying amount of the asset may not be fully recoverable. So when you test it for impairment, it shall test the asset for impairment by estimating its recoverable amount and the impairment loss should be factored in after considering this additional amount. So it shall test the asset by estimating its recoverable amount. So if there is any change, you also need to compare that change and compare it with the recoverable amount which is there based on index 38 and then account for any impairment loss. So the impairment can also arise because of the change really in your decommissioning or site restoration liability present value cost which you capitalize. I think this will be probably looked at in detail when the impairment standard is also touched upon. Now if there is a revaluation model which you are following, so there also if there are any changes in the liability after the revaluations, after the revaluation surplus or deficit, the decrease in the liability shall subject to be recognized in your OCI because anything changes in the revaluation always goes to OCI. So any changes in the liability after the revaluation surplus or deficit should also be adjusted into the OCI unless it is in excess of whatever balance is there in your revaluation surplus, in which case it has to go to the PNL. So that is the sum and substance really of this requirement. What to the extent of what is already there in that up to the revaluation surplus amount goes into the PNL, balance has to go to the it goes to the OCI, the balance if any in excess of whatever is your balance in your evaluation surplus goes to the PNL account. Now what may happen is you may have an asset which has an estimated useful life of 10 years but there is still some balance which is already there in your decommissioning, restoration and other liabilities. You have not been able to incur a full expenditure or you have not really been able to complete the restoration work. But the useful life of the asset is over. So in that case, whatever is the difference has to be any subsequent changes in the liability after the useful life has expired goes to the PNL. See the basic mining or whatever, the life of that is over. Now you will not be able to get any more oil or you may not be able to get any more minerals or anything from those assets. So the useful life of that equipment is over. But the restoration work is still not completed. Restoration work can continue even after the useful life is over. So that any changes now in the decommissioning or restoration or site restoration liabilities has to be now taken to the PNL. Plus any changes which happen, your unwinding of the discount which happens also has to be considered as a finance cost as it occurs. You cannot capitalize that under India's equity by saying that it is a borrowing cost. So this is one important area that exists in decommissioning restoration liabilities. That is a major gap change, which all of you need to be a little more aware of compared to the other items. See, the disclosures are fairly routine. I am not getting into it. They are more or less on the similar lines of what we already have in our existing AS10. The only changes are this first item here. Existence of amounts of restrictions on title is already disclosed. And equipment which is pledged as security. That amount has to be quantified. Now this is again another area where I have seen companies 
have not to be proper in the disclosures. They are not quantifying the amount of the fixed assets which are pledged as security for the IDs. Companies are only giving it as part of their borrowing schedule secured by hypothecation of plant and machinery or whatever assets situated at so and so location. But what is the value of those items is not disclosed. So that again the requirement. So this is also one of the areas where the disclosures are not proper. I have observed a lot of companies. They are not disclosing and quantifying the amount, but you are required. Otherwise, contractual commitments and all that, all the other items are more or less what is there. If it, there is a revaluation, there are more elaborate disclosures which are there. Because revaluation means again fair value. Fair value again you need to, to refer to, to some extent under EPS 113. And especially how are the estimates made. So that is what you need to discuss. So what is more important is point number C and point number D. And then again point number E also is important. What would have been the amount recognized had the assets been carried at cost model? So that is also again what is the cost model if you would have followed for the assets which are already revalued. This also again maybe all the companies are not disclosing these details properly. Transition issues. As we saw in the, to the earlier speaker, the major transition issue and the EDS involves this property plant and equipment. Whether you take the previous step carrying amount or fair value for deemed cost for selected items can also be considered as, as the revised deemed cost. Now in case the fair value is taken as the deemed cost, the same has to be allocated component wise. I think earlier I think ITFG was taking a view that you cannot do a selective fair valuation but then I think now based on the exposure graph you know, that is now permissible as was discussed earlier. Capital work in progress also is in the nature of a PP and hence previous cap carrying amount can also be used for PP. One of the other options is even if, if you need not follow the deep cost, you need not do a selective fair valuation, you can do a retrospective measurement of the PP. That is also the third option which is available on transition. The depreciation in that case would need to be recomputed in accordance with EDS 16. And EDS 16, as I said, is now expected and is consistent with Schedule 2. So you need to ensure that it is in accordance with Schedule 2. The rates which are determined under your erstwhile Schedule 14 may not always be the appropriate rates because the Schedule 14 rates may not necessarily correspond to the actual useful life based on a technical evaluation and based on the other parameters which are laid down in the standard which we saw in an earlier slide. So if you do a retrospective measurement, you need, see, here also a question arises that when the new companies act came to be, the companies at that point of time were already required to recompute the depreciation in accordance with Schedule 2 rates. And if wherever there was any difference, that had to go to the retail earnings. So in the normal course, this adjustment would have been taken care of when the new companies act itself came into the picture. But if for some reason that is not done and the company opts for a retrospective remeasurement of PP, then you need to be careful if you have still continued to follow the Schedule 14 rates. 
So that is something which is akin to an error which is there. But you are correcting it that you, in your transition adjustments, you need to distinguish that this is really an error which is there which you are correcting. So you may take the adjustment to the retail earnings. But you cannot just say that your schedule 14 itself is the rate with correspondence without making an assessment of the useful time of the schedule. See, transition issues and challenges mainly for the first time an option is to you have to go in for mandatory componentization. So if companies have not done this will create transition challenges. You cannot necessarily always take shelter behind the fact that you are being cost. Because if there are certain individual components which are material you and having a different useful life, you need to now split that up. Not only on transition but even going forward also. So all your manufacturing companies, IT companies and all that. So this could have a significant impact on your insurance, on your asset debt financing and various other matters. So these are some challenges which are there. The treatment of capital spares also is a transition issue and challenge, which we already discussed. Revaluation also, as I said now, no selective, regular updation. Appreciation charge to be charged off to the income statement, very clear. It is there even now under the Companies Act. See, this is where again comparability could be affected. Some companies may follow evaluation, some companies may follow cost model and all that. Then there could be higher depreciation also. Repairs and overall expenditure also now you need to be very careful whether it is in the nature of a replacement which needs to be capitalized as a component and then you have to also recapitalize. So more closer scrutiny of the renewal and asset management and maintenance policies, especially of the asset heavy companies. So these are some of the challenges which are there on transition. Unrealized exchange differences. If companies are opting for a para 46A, that is they are committed to follow this till FY 2024 up to whatever was there on the date of transition. Whereas some companies may retrospectively list it and disregard that. But going forward, all exchange differences now have to be charged off. So this is again another challenge. There could be greater volatility, comparability, especially going forward companies which have huge overseas borrowings. There could be a huge volatility in the results because now in the spot, all exchange differences have to be charged off. So here these are some of the system changes mainly for manufacturing and IT related companies especially for componentization, regular assessment of the useful life, residual values, greater management judgments and estimates. You may need expert assistance also in several cases. So these are some of the softer challenges, business challenges which are there. So again, this brings us to the fact that EPS is not just an accountant's or finance department's job. It involves a lot of IT system support. It involves a lot of technical help also. So this is just some of the instances. So this is as far as fixed assets is concerned. I think we'll go to PP because some of the principal have we go to investment property. Some of the principles are similar for investment properties, and then we can probably take some questions because some of the basic principles are same for investment property also. Now here, as far as investment property is concerned, this is again an entirely new standard. Or not I would say a new standard, not entirely. Because investment property, there was only a brief one-line reference under our existing AS topic. How, what, what constitutes investment property, but there was nothing else. So now the basic principles have been codified. Most of the accounting principles for an investment property are same as what we have seen for fixed assets. So I will just run through that. The only important issues are what is the, the classification part. When to categorize something as an investment property is what you need to do that. 
and the other major about this that here we have not gone in for a fair value model for investment property but the fair value needs to be disclosed and the basis on which it has to be done and it has to be done by a proper independent value that has to be given so that is still an additional headache and cost for the companies who need to evaluate and assess and ascertain the fair value on an annual basis transition issues are not much otherwise as i said see most of the definition and are only the classification issues is something which we will spend a little more time otherwise as objective and this is where it is not much of an issue the standard is also applicable when the lessee under finance lease gives the property or rental to others we will just go into that a little later and also applicable to the lessor's financial status of investment property provided to a lessee under operating lease we just deal with this later this scope comes so whatever is covered under the lease standard in the s17 that is scope of classification recognition of lease income from investment property is scoped out measurement in the lessee's financial statement of a property interest rent under a lease accounted for and measurement in the lessor's financial statements of the net investment so that is excluded say that these that transactions then again your mineral rights and biological assets since there is a separate standard dealing with them either as 41 or in the s16 Now, what is the definition of an investment property? We will just spend some more time on the definition and the classification with some examples. An investment property is a property, either land or building. Generally, it will be land or building or a part of a building held by the owner, right? Or held by a lessee under a finance lease. Risks and rewards of ownership are with the lessee, so lessee under a finance lease. Purpose is to earn rentals. So that is simple. Or for capital appreciation or both. This or for capital appreciation is very important. You may not be earning rental income, but you may still be having certain land or building in your balance sheet. You, it is now vacant. You do not have any plans to. utilize it for your business purposes in the future you are not in the real estate business so you are not holding it as a land bank but you may dispose it of if at all whenever it is favorable so you are holding it for capital appreciation so you need to basically treat it as an investment property this is important so again at the transition day this assessment is very important and this assessment is very critical we will see a couple of examples later on to explain this otherwise other than for production or in the sale in the ordinary course of business the as 13 definition is very simple land and building that is not intended to be occupied substantially or used in the operation of the entity there is no it is to earn rental income or for capital appreciation so an owner occupied property is a property held by the owner or by a lessee under a finance lease for use in the production or supply of goods it generates an investment property generates independent cash flows so it is like a separate cgu cash generating unit examples of investment property land held for long term capital appreciation rather than short term sale in the ordinary course of business or land held for a currently undetermined future use this is very important very closely you need to scrutinize the land which is there any vacant land which is lying for donkey's years in your balance sheet do you have a plan or not or not Was it of may get classified as an investment property? Building owned by the entity or held by the entity under a finance lease, and it is given on lease under one of our operating leases. Building that is vacant, but the intention is to lease it out under one of our operating leases. 
So here again the intention of the management is very important. Property is being constructed or developed for future use as an investment property. You are constructing it, but not for your factory or something, but for future use as an investment property. So here again, intention of the management, substance over form, plays a very important role. This is again an area which is neglected probably, hasn't got the degree of attention which it should, but it is very important. Property intended for sale in the ordinary course of business in the process of construction by a real estate developer or for development or sale. Property lease to another entity under a finance lease is also not considered as an investment property. Owner occupied property we all know. Only one thing which is important here, which is specifically there in the EKS is property which is occupied by the employees. Even if the company is charging rent from them at the normal market rates, is not considered as investment property even though you are earning rental income. Specifically excluded. So that at least it remains as a fixed asset. Because ultimately it is for the use of the employees in the course of the business and all that. The intention is not to earn, you are getting the rental income fine, that is a bonus. But otherwise, that is not the intention, it is not to outsider. Now a question arises after the employee, whether if his family continues to occupy after the death of an employee. But then it's again a separate issue. That is again not very clear. Owner occupied property awaiting disposal. Awaiting disposal is okay, you have used it, it was occupied and not everything you are awaiting. So that suddenly it does not become a property held for capital appreciation. It is only right from a very beginning. So here again, a lot of grey areas, management, intention and judgments have to be very closely looked at. Now, a, a property which is partly owner occupied and partly let off. If it is separately identifiable, then the portions have to be separately. But if the portions cannot be separately sold, the property is an investment property normally unless an insignificant portion is held for use in the production or supply. So that is where you have to again be careful. So if the portion cannot be sold separately, the property is considered as an investment property only even if an insignificant portion is held for sale, uh, use in the production or supply of goods. So what is the predominant intention or use or purpose is what needs to be assessed and ascertained. Now another important aspect in classification, ancillary services. So even in case of a let out property, classification sometimes depends on whether the owner provides significant ancillary services or it provides insignificant ancillary services. Now, former case means in case of significant, the property would not be classified as an investment property. They take a case of an entity which owns and manages a hotel and services provided to the guests are a significant portion of the entire arrangement. Then it is that owner managed property, it is an own property. See, in a hotel, if it is an owner managed hotel, then it remains an own property. However, if it is a third party or a franchising model, then there is a lot of judgment is required. Whether the owner is a passive investor and he gets a fixed return, then it is an investment property. Otherwise, if it is a variable return based on a percentage of your revenue or profit and so on, then it may not necessarily be an investment property. So that is where again, especially for hotel companies, again, especially the ones who are in the franchising model, you need to see whether it is a passive investment or whether it is an active investment, another important criteria. Then in the latter case, when insignificant ancillary services, then in that case, for example, security and maintenance services provided to lessees who occupy the building property under an operating lease. 
So security and maintenance services provided, they are insignificant ancillary services. So the predominant classification remains as an investment property. So here, what are the ancillary services also need to be factored into account, especially hotels or all these wherever on a business is on a franchisee model is what you need to really see. Now many times you are preparing consolidated accounts, so between lease down to holding a subsidiary company. So here also there may be cases when an entity owns property that is leased to and occupied by its parent or by another subsidiary. So here you have to remember that from the point of view of your consolidated financial statements, it is not an investment property because you look at the group as a whole. Because the property is an owner-occupied property from the perspective of the group. However, from the perspective of the entity that holds it, you have to see if it is an investment property, if it meets the definition. So that in the individual statements, it will be separate. Therefore, the lesser treats it as an investment property in its individual financial statements. Are we clear? So the classification in a consolidated and in a standalone would be different. So this was really the core part theory of the standard, how to classify and identify. Now your recognition is the similar as fixed assets. Probable that future economic benefits cost can be reliably measured. Nothing different from what we saw for PP. Initial measurement also at cost. Then any purchase price and directly attributable expenditure. Then any startup costs also to bring the property. Operating losses incurred before the investment property plan development. Here, this is important. Like how in an inventory also any abnormal amounts or any operating losses before it can achieve its land level of occupancy. Similar logic we apply here. Then any losses incurred before the investment property achieves its plan level of occupancy in the initial startup phase. Property acquired at the finance is the lower of the fair value or the present value of the MLP in accordance with AS17. Premium paid is included in the MLP, so that again from the leasing perspective, so that is your initial measurement. Subsequent costs have to be charged off. Replacement costs, same logic as your component accounting. Exchange also the same, whether it lacks commercial substance or not, absolutely the same as your PP. So I am not repeating that, it's the same. Now, initial recognition if the fair value of the asset received is not clearly evident, otherwise it is fair value of the asset given, so that is the normal for an exchange transaction. If it is on a deferred consideration basis, the discounting, the interest element, you need to separate it out. So that is also what we saw even for property plant and equipment. Post recognition, cost model remains mandatory. Unlike IAS 40, as I said, the corresponding IAS also permits the fair value model. So here, in per, as per India's 40, all investment properties shall be in accordance with India's 16 requirements. Subsequent measurement. You follow the principles as is applicable to property, plant and equipment. So component-wise depreciation you need to factor in. So any major interior work and all that renovation which you do, that may be a separate component. Then if it is criteria held for sale, then you may need to show it as assets held for disposal at fair value less cost of disposal. Now if it is a, now yours, see many times it may so happen that the use of the property may change. The usage of the property may change, so you need to reclassify. So transfers to or from will be made only when and when there is a change in the use. So that may be either commencement of owner occupation for a transfer of investment property to owner occupied property, correct? Or commencement of development with a view to sell. So you have developed it then, so then it takes transfer to inventories. Many companies do it. They have vacant property, they use it for development, for constructing houses or for whatever other purposes. A separate real estate division is there effectively. So then that property then gets transferred to inventories. End of the owner occupation, 
for a transfer from owner occupied property to investment. There may be some property, just take an example, which was owned by an, which was used by an employee. Now it is that property employee either retires, so that property is now given to some outsider on rent. So that situation gets transferred from an owner occupied property to an investment property. For commencement of an operating lease to another party for transfer from inventories to investment property. So you have something which is held for sale. But then you decide that hey, no, I am not able to sell it. Market is very poor, so let me earn some rental income. So I give it on a five-year lease. So it gets changed from inventories and gets transferred from inventories to investment property. The carry value should not be changed whenever you transfer. Only you need to reassess the useful life. Because the useful life of an owner-occupied property and the useful life of an investment property may be different. The recognition principles are the same. So I am not going into those. The disclosures, accounting policy criteria for classification. The disclosure of the fair value by a qualified independent value. That is the term which is used in the standard by a qualified independent valuer. So you cannot go on the basis of a management determined fair value. You may have you have to get an independent value to look at it. He may not necessarily do a fresh valuation every year, but it has to be looked at and assessed by an independent. If some valuer has done it last year, he may confirm that the value is not significantly different. But it has to be looked at by an independent valuer. Any contractual obligations. The amount recognized in the PL on rental income and direct operating expenses. That typically most of these disclosures I have seen many companies have been giving below the investment property schedule itself. Whatever is the rental income you are owning, you need to disclose. And the direct operating expenses, mainly any administrative expenses, any taxes which you are paying, any repairs and maintenance costs and so on. So direct operating expenses. The depreciation and useful life and the reconciliation of the opening and closing balance, similar to what we have for fixed assets. Reconciliation of the impairment losses and all those transfers to or from inventories and owner occupied any of whatever you see. So that you can just speak to that. For a fair value. If you cannot determine the fair value, you have to give an explanation. If the fair value in exceptional cases cannot be measured reliably, then it shall disclose and give the explanation as to why. And what still it has to state that it needs to give the range of the estimates with which the fair value is likely to lie. See here also the voluntary exemptions about the deemed cost continues. So this may be identified on the date of transition based on the INAS criteria. It need not be similar to the India's 16 exception. Fair value is deep cost exception, however, cannot be done as for an amendment which is recently come out. Clear? Otherwise, more or less it is the same. See, here I think there are maybe we can quickly just read through some of the case studies. See, ex limited and its subsidiaries have provided you as their India specialist with the list of properties which they own. Land for an undetermined future use. Okay. Vacant building owned by ex limited to be leased out under an operating lease. Property held by a subsidiary or real estate firm in the ordinary course of its business. Huh? Property held for use in the production. Yes. Yes. Hotel owned by Z Limited. A subsidiary of X Limited. 
for which Z Limited provides security services to its guests for its guests' belongings. Okay, so not very difficult. A, B, and E would qualify as investment properties. So your only thing is for E, ancillary or non ancillary, you have to see. Active managed or passive managed, we, we discussed. C and E, very clear, it is inventory or PP. Now, this is again X Limited purchased land in Maharashtra in 2011 with an intent to construct a block of office buildings for sale to end customers. And accordingly, the classification as inventory was correct. Post the acquisition, there was a fall in the prices for the office buildings and hence it was decided to build residential apartments and lease the same to the tenants. Okay, so first inventory now. In June 2012, the requisite permissions to commence the construction was received. Construction started in September 2012. It has commenced negotiations with the customers for leasing, though no deal has been finalized. So what do you do post the change of plans? See, at what point of time it needs to be transferred from inventory to investment property? Preparation of revised business plans to reflect the future rental income potential. See, mainly since the permissions have been received, construction and comments and negotiations to find the customers and all is there in substance, you can say that now the intention is to lease it out and on rental income. So transfer to investment property then would appear to be justified once the preparations of the revised business plan is there and the comments with the development has actually happened. Now, which of the following should be treated as an investment property under it? An entity has a factory which is no longer required and it's held for sale. Held for sale, yes, identified as for sale. Huh? It's classified as held for sale. Classified as held for sale. The farmland has been acquired for its investment potential. No permission has been obtained for any kind of construction activity. Investment. A factory is in the process of being constructed on behalf of the government. This is important. What is this? Process of being constructed on behalf of the government. No, not service concession may not be, but it is you are in the you are a construction contractor. So it is like you are doing it is your you are in the business presumably of doing construction. And a new office building was purchased by a financial services entity as its head office, specifically in the center of a major metropolitan city to exploit its potential appreciation in the future. Let us see. Property held for sale first is very clear. Primary capital appreciation because of its investment potential. Now third party you are doing a construction so yes never. The last thing is you have to remember one thing. See it is an office building purchased to exploit its potential appreciation in the future. It has not decided still entirely. See, somebody may purchase a Morgan Stanley or anybody may purchase something for its potential. They may decide later on to shift their headquarters here or they may decide to later on give it out. It is still undetermined future use. So it would be better to treat it as a property plant and equipment. It is of course again an area where it involves a lot of judgment. Maybe we can yes take some questions. Yes. I just need one clarification in respect of one thing that you said. Sorry? A clarification required from you. Yes, sure. Uh, you said in respect of all exchange differences. Yes. On borrowings. Yes. They go to profit and loss account. Yes. But if I'm not mistaken, 
There is one component of exchange difference, which is exchange difference to extent considered as an adjustment to borrowing cost. Yes. That would be no, as I said, it is in accordance. I mean, of course, looking at the requirements of year in their spending, so that would still continue as yeah, yeah, that is okay. Sir. Well, to the extent it is an adjustment to the interest cost, it may not be considered. Yes. yes. Second one is change in method of depreciation. Yes. Yes, change in the use, estimate in useful life considered as an estimate. No, even a change in the method of depreciation under NDS, under IFRS, is also considered as a change in estimate. Unlike under Indian debt, that is a difference. So, change in accounting policy is what? Change, so even if you change from so WDB to SLM, yeah. under India Cap it is a change in an accounting policy you need to do retrospectively. Right. Under India it remains as a change in an accounting estimate. Even if you change the method of depreciation. So no retrospective adjustment? No. Okay, and in decommissioning liabilities. Yes. Where there is a change in decommissioning liability, you apply that to the change discount rate. Let's say there is a change in discount rate. Yes. So you apply the change discount rate. Yes. What about the unwinding of the discount? Do you apply the revised discount rate? Or yeah, it will, it, will be, be, it will be the revised discount rate. So on a yearly basis, when the discount rate is You need to evaluate also whether the discount rate is also reasonable because discount rate also can change. Okay, okay thank you. Yes. Any other questions? Maybe one, two more, one more. Yes, yes. Mike, please. If, if you don't mind, I'll just take a seat, please. Yes, please. Sir, regarding the revaluation of assets, yes. you said no selective revaluation permitted. Yes. This kind of drop by even though the uh, company desire to do revaluation of plant and machinery, yeah. so they can say that way? Yes, all plant and machinery have to be revaluated. So drop, it is like a, if they want to revalue land only and they don't want to do Yeah, they can do class of assets, yes. Okay. Selective means not selective. One land you can revalue okay. and another land you don't revalue or okay. one plant and machinery you revalue and another don't. That is not permissible. Okay. Class is to be class, yes. Okay. Maybe one more? Yes. One more? Yeah. Sir, hello. Yes. Uh, sir, in case of real estate, the township is been developed, township. Yes. So, but it is such a large that uh, currently the retail shops are not being able to sell. And because of that, the company has decided to sell it on uh, return the lease. So, whether you consider No, no, it? first of all, can you just come back in the beginning? Can you You are a real estate company? Yeah. Okay, so you have constructed a township. Yes, sir. Okay. It's a residential township and for that I have some few uh, retail shops. Yes. But correctly it's not in a position to sell. Yes. So I have decided to give it on this. Yes. So whether it will be considered as an investment property or Yes. You could take a view that it is an investment property if you intend to sell it, but you intend to give it on lease. Yes. And but, all uh, the it is for a very short period of four to five years only. That's and okay. I think uh, four to five reason. years is a long period, four to five months would be a short period. No, but I have a condition that uh, if I, uh, I have a buyer, I can move out the lease in a six month, give six month notice. In such case, there will be a inventory or inventory. See, there also you can, I mean, you have an option, but you may not get a buyer within six months. So, I mean, you. You can treat it as an investment property once you have given it or lease, you have entered into an agreement for five years with an option that you may have to vacate within six months, that is okay. That may or may not happen. Okay. So secondly for the uh, in case of uh, PT, so there are two options. One is the deal cost yes. and second is the fair value. Ah. So but uh, once it has been done. I can continue with the no, cost. No, fair value as deal yes. cost. So you do a one-time fair valuation and that revised fair value becomes your deal cost. Okay. So yes. after that I can continue that cost as a Yeah, cost that would be your revised deal cost. Okay. That so is not that you can do for selected items of items of fixed assets. You can take the deal cost. So whatever the deal cost. Deal, 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 fair value as the deal cost. So whatever the gain or loss in that is, I have to... No, no, that only here. is an opening, and that is only a transition adjustment, so that goes to your retail learning in terms of EDS 101. Okay, retail learning. Yes, it Thank is you. a transition adjustment. Thank you. Uh, last question. Yeah, yeah, yeah last, last. 
Rating unless if someone else wants to answer it, I would prefer sure. that person to be given as a judge. Otherwise, sure. okay. Sure. So, can do you give him the last chance? Okay, fine. Because I am just saying that the judges should also equally. Yes, well, yes, sir. I have got inventory which is a cost for net realizable value, whichever is low. Yeah. Now I am giving it on operating lease. So I classify it as investment property. Yeah. The moment I classify it as investment property, uh -huh. should I restate my restate my inventory to its original cost? No, whatever was its carrying value. If it, if you are carrying it at your NRV, that is your carrying value in the books on the date of transfer. So it has to be taken at the carrying value. Very much, thank you. Okay, thank you very much.